All right, my friends, welcome to episode 431 of Prof and Dev Play Games. My name is Larry, the professor at uh, Prof Plays Games on Blue Sky. And over there is not the dev. The dev is in Japan sending me pictures of all of his exploits. But over there is Bill, one of, uh, I think, of a few people uh, on campus. Uh, Bill's a colleague of mine. He's been on the podcast before, uh, who are famous for cussing. And I feel like it's you and me. (laughs) So I'm so happy to have you on this podcast. (laughs) Well, certain... um... Arts professors are also known for it. Very true. Um, That's true. We're not the only uh, one. That's for sure. (laughs) But I I surely am. uh, My department once gave me from someone who is retiring a uh, metal uh, little sculpture of a bomb with the letter F on it. (laughs) So that is quite fitting. Yes. Uh, well, I'm glad to have you here, Bill. Thanks for stepping into the breach while Anthony is away in Japan. Um, and I'm excited to talk about all the things we're going to talk about. So. I am greatly honored that you've asked me to come back after uh, literally our last talk was criticizing you. I can understand banishing me into the doghouse for two years. Last so. time you were on here, you said mean things to me, and I said never again. I know. I know. <laughs> Terrible me. Uh, I have good news for you. Um, oh. I think it's good news. It's good news. I'm not sure it's news for you specifically, but I finally picked up uh, Stray Gods. I saw those on sale. I saw. I'm so excited. And actually, that's something we could do a brief news mention on because I'm super excited about this. But why don't you describe what Stray Gods is? since? uh... Well, Stray Gods is that musical. David Gator who worked with Mm -hmm. a bunch of really uh, famous voice actors and theater um, folks. Uh, Anthony Rapp is is one of them. I've I've heard of him. Um, But they do some really cool singing. I'm a big fan of musical theater, but I and video games, obviously. But um, I just never picked the game up because I was busy doing other things. But the Ludo Narrative Con is going on on Steam, and I spent some money on a few games, and that was one of them. So I'm excited to get into that. I saw it was deck verified. I'm playing a ton on my Steam Deck, so I'm looking forward to jumping into that after I finish the game I'm currently playing, which I'll talk yeah. about later. No, um, that's but, the you're gonna have so much fun. That's a lovely, lovely game. And you have you played through it once, twice? Uh, just once. Mm-hmm. Um, the uh, well, I certainly can see the value of replayability. There's also something joyous in the primary experience. Um. The uh, the setup is beautiful. Um, again, for full disclosure, uh, Anthony Rapp, as you mentioned, is also a friend of mine, so I may be biased. But um, I'll have to be honest, uh, of all the songs that are in there, I think his song, not that it's sung the worst, he's great, but um, I think it was the, the least well-written song of a lot of them. And so, and, and his is still very good. Um, but it's a great, great game. And now they've just announced um, this summer DLC that focuses on his character, which had more of a a much smaller role in the game. So that's very exciting. The, the Anthony Rap is in it. That is very exciting that they're going to dig into his character. Do you think it's, or do you know, or have any idea if it's the only DLC planned or if they're going to do a couple pieces? Or I don't know. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, again, it was just uh, recently. Uh, shown to us that that was coming out and he was able to make the announcement. I'm sure he's under a lot of NDAs, so I try not to press him on the matter. Um, But uh, I'm very, very excited for it because the fact that his character was left a little undeveloped, um, it was an important character because they don't use that many in the game. But again, of all of them, I think that was the one that really had a lot more room to grow because it was kind of an antagonistic character that then never really went further than the moment of antagonism. Is this the, um, the hell is it? Stray gods Orpheus. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, cool. Yeah. I'm checking that out right now. I just added it to my wish list. I love the cover art here. There's a guitar, two people back to back. One of them playing guitar. Is that Orpheus? The one with the long. That's him. Okay, cool. Uh, all right. Well, I'm sold. That sounds good. I want to let's see. This comes out June 27th. I will be able to finish this game before then. Um, so I'm I'm looking forward to that. We'll have cool. to bring you on again when I finish that game so we can talk about it. Awesome. But I uh, will have to tease you a little bit. That's okay. Um, I went I, back and actually I really had a good time listening to our. Uh, 
You went previous. back and listened to our old fucking episode. <laughs> yeah. Well, oh, I no. wanted to make sure on the what was I playing. It wasn't anything I'd covered two years ago since I had a few. Mm-hmm. Um, and in doing so, I made notes of the games that you got all excited about and put on your wish list. Oh, did and you're gonna you're gonna fucking quiz me if I actually play. <laughs> no, I don't have to quiz you because I looked on your um, <laughs> play. And I know that I'm sure I have not. Um, <laughs> Antihero? No. Mm. Overboard? No. I'm surprised you didn't do that one. Of all of them, Overboard <laughs> seemed to be the one I thought you would most likely do. Um, because that's oh. by the people who made 80 Days. Overboard, I did play. Oh, what? Well, okay. Was it on like uh, the Switch or? No, no, no. I have I have uh, point three hours on record and got an ending. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> did you get like the one early bad ending or something? I got an early very bad ending. Yes, exactly. Which is exactly what I mean. That's how the game starts effectively. Yeah, exactly. Um, that's exactly what happened. Uh, but I did play that tactics. one. Thank you. Oh, okay. Simeon. I apologize. Winter Moon yeah. Tactics Club, I do not believe you played in the No, elf. that is not true. Or that is true, I did not. Raging Loop? Nope. And then I don't think you even bought Chess of Blades. No, I don't think so. I don't think yes. I, I don't think I bought Raging Loop either. I think that's mm-hmm. Anyway, just just giving you a little bit of a tweak. That's all. <laughs> Thank you. And thanks for tuning in to Prof and Dev Play Games. Now we're done. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> well, that would be about the same amount of time you played overboard. Ah, so. <laughs> God damn, man. <laughs> Uh, this is a. Uh, <laughs> you didn't know a, that today was a roast. Oh my god! This is a roasting start to this podcast. Um, so, stray gods. Looking forward to getting to that, and let's see if I do that before the DLC comes out. I'm committing to it here, so we'll see if okay, I follow I'm through on that. Um, how how have you been otherwise in the gaming in gaming life since last time we uh, talked to you? Um, playing a lot. Um, I. I did a little list, and uh, it ends up that since last we talked, I have, I think, over 50 games that I've played, uh, which is not bad, I guess, for two years. No, that's, that sounds pretty good for two years. Yeah. So I'm, I'm sure surprised, though, because wrong. you put a lot of money or a lot of time into, like, a few games. So that's, that is yeah. interesting. Yeah. And well, there are some that I... Uh, that don't work out. And also some time is uh, expanded because I'll leave the, I, I have a lot of Ram for my machine. So I just leave it in the background Sure, and I'll forget. And so I might have a game quote unquote, like Baldur's Gate three running in the background for days mm-hmm. accidentally. But, and then also because I mod things, it, um, I can end up having the game open without playing it, but, interacting with it mm-hmm. so i was thinking about i was going to ask you later about it maybe i will now um and i probably did last time you listened to the episode but i know that you have a lot of time into elder scrolls online oh yeah still play mm-hmm. and there's been a bunch of you know bad xbox news but that's still i mean it's obviously a game that you love but yeah well it, it it's part a game that i love and part a game i'm on the treadmill of oh yeah it, it feels like that any given time I have to have one MMO and one mobile game that has its hooks into me. Mm -hmm. Um, Unfortunately, I do have an addictive kind of personality that once you get into a achievement sunk cost, um, oh, I'm a member of a guild, and so I feel I have a commitment that I have to fulfill, you know, sort of thing. Right. And so I think... Last time we talked, I was still in uh, the mobile Injustice 2 game because mm-hmm. yep. our guild leader quit, and then I ended up becoming the guild leader for like two years, which was probably a year and a half more than my actual interest, but then I felt responsible. Um, I mean, I enjoyed it, but again, like any of these um, money sink fests, I... Uh, you have this weird regret, <laughs> you know, to it. Yeah. Um, but if so, I'm still playing. I'm enjoying it, but I find myself more um, 
able to be very casual about it. I, I log in once a day to do the dailies, uh, but it, it unfortunately does not encourage me to do more because the severe limits on bank space, and particularly with all the cosmetics, which are primarily um, home furnishing items, there's no bank for just that. And so it's a constant struggle to um, try and manage my cosmetics to the point that I don't have as much anxiousness to acquire as many as I used to. Is there still new story um, coming? Oh, yeah, no, they, yeah. they okay. every quarter. Oh, they, okay. That's nice. And, and they're reviving. So every... Um, Every festival that they do, they add new content or tweak it a little bit, uh, usually for the better. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's just, again, a game that their storylines are wonderful. I'm way behind on getting all of them done. Eventually, I'll get to some of them and others I won't. We'll see. Yeah. I, was, I was talking to my mom today for Mother's Day, and as usually happens, 90% of the conversation was her filling me in on, on the last year of WoW. Um, oh, mm-hmm. And I was thinking, man, I know it's, WoW is social for her, but like, there's other MMOs that have like story that I think she would be interested in, like Final Fantasy XIV. And then I thought, yeah, so when I was um, looking at what you'd been playing lately, uh, but she was like, nope, <laughs> I'm happy yep. with WoW. I'm like, all right, all right. Have you... Um... Did you and your daughter stick it all with Dreamlight Valley? We played it, God, it was like a year ago now for probably two or three months. And then we came back to it like a uh, two months ago, maybe, uh, on mm-hmm. the Xbox. And a little bit, but she fell off it. She wasn't um, as into it as she had been before, so we haven't really stuck with it. Yeah, that's my other MMO that I still hang with. They've had a couple of really interesting updates Again, that's one where I feel like I can do like the little bit of a daily thing, mm-hmm. um, run a couple of quests. Again, they 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 want to get you on the treadmill. Um, oh yeah, absolutely. But they added in a cute mini game called Scramble Coin, which is like a a bit like a kind of checkers slash shogi kind of game. And the pieces you have are collectible. So, you know, like a chess piece has certain moves, the different pieces you collect can move differently on the board. Right. So winning different games gets you the collectible pieces, which are, of course, all based on Disney properties. Well, I like the idea, you know, just this cozy farming sim kind of game that was based on Disney properties. So that game having another game inside of it based on Disney is... a pretty fun idea. Yeah. No, um, I, but most importantly, they um, they keep on opening up new things. They have areas that feel like the Monsters Incorporated mm-hmm. felt very that. Um, but the main territory of the main islands is now getting very crowded. Right. And even They're though you can things. Mm-hmm. move things around and now there's a whole second world. And they have a clear mechanism to eventually have multiple worlds where you can build in. And, like, if a character annoys you, you can move them to another world, um, which is interesting, which for a lot of people, that was Donald Duck. Um, <laughs> is it? Do you have to move the whole franchise? You can just move one character. No, you can just move one character. <laughs> kind of banish them. Oh, my God. That's funny. Um, their most recent addition was uh, Oswald, which is a really oh, yeah. interesting mm. choice. So that's interesting because I, be, I was reading uh, uh, Blood, Sweat, and Pixels by Jason Schreier, which was recounting uh, War Inspector Studio that made Epic Mickey and how they were trying to get you know the, the fight early on to get Oswald in there and how that came about. So that awesome just reminded me of that. Cool. Um, so we'll talk more about what we're playing later. Uh, yes. but you had uh, you were digging back in the archives and wanted to bring back the conversation about $70 games. <laughs> well, I was triggered. Um, so one of my favorite channels, and I'm sure you've followed it before too, is um, the Extra Credits channel, which I believe was 
I know at one time was part of the escapist network mm-hmm. uh, long ago in the ancient far away. Um, and now they do extra credits, extra gaming, extra history. Um, and I've always enjoyed them. Are you familiar with them as a... The animation is super fam- familiar to me, so I feel like I've seen them somewhere else. So that, what you just said makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, I, I don't. I have not seen this channel as extra credits. Okay. And um, they made a proposition in a very recent... Now, I'm, again, full of scopes for a Patreon supporter of theirs. Um, mind you, at $1, so I'm a big spender. Um, <laughs> well, any but, support is good support. Yeah. But they uh, they once again offered a proposition that um, seventy dollar games were basically okay because technically, with inflation, that's lower than prices have ever been for games, and therefore, in fact, at the end, they almost suggest it's more of a messaging perception problem, which. Uh, I was quite um, not happy with. Mm-hmm. So I uh, wrote a strongly worded letter to the editor that won't be seen. Uh, but yeah, that reopened the idea of having that conversation. But you said you've been thinking about it yourself. And so let me ping the, it to you. The initial conversation, or it was a while ago. I can't remember yeah. how long it's been, $70 now. Since Was it since the beginning of this generation? Um, well, when we were talking about two years ago, they were talking about trying to standardize it. At okay, so it's been in the middle, or since the generation. Mm-hmm. Initially, I, I, you know, I, I think that argument has some merit in that the, you know, some Super Nintendo carts from the 90s, like Chrono Trigger, for example, is famously like $90 and adjusted for inflation. $90 is really like eight bazillion dollars an hour what the fuck ever so i understand that argument and i was thinking you know game development is getting more expensive and to keep up like it it makes sense that executives or the c-suite want to raise game prices and now thinking about really in in the last two weeks um what's been going on with xbox where Mm -hmm. They're, they're, you know, taking Tango Gameworks, for example, where Tango Gameworks has a, a critically successful game of uh, Hi-Fi Rush that is a game that, you know, Microsoft needs, really, those kind of games for Game Pass. They need the small games that go along with their, you know, big first-party games. So the idea that in that climate where they have games that are coming out that is filling out their Game Pass needs and doing well for them in the critical sphere... Um, I could see why like a $70 game or, or, or that whole argument makes sense because they need it moving forward. But with Microsoft's recent quarterly reports, and I think this is including Activision Blizzard acquisition, so it kind of fucks the numbers a little bit, but they're like up profit wise, like 28% or 32% yep. or something like that. And despite that, they're closing game studios, they're shutting down projects uh, square is doing the same thing they wrote down in the last two or three weeks 140 million dollars with the projects that they basically canceled so the idea i think that i naively thought a couple years ago that like 70 dollars games are a necessary evil because it's going to allow them to create these these bigger games and create more games and fund ma- mainly like fund the studios and keep people employed Boy, was that wrong. <laughs> like, yeah. absolutely wrong. Like, there's no... The profits have increased. Game prices have increased. More games are being sold than ever. I know the game cost, the cost to actually develop games is going up too. So it's, you know, it's, it's probably a Pyrrhic victory in that way. But the... I think the main thrust of my argument was, sh- okay, I pay $10 more, but that in some way guarantees, and that's a silly word to use, but I'll just use it, guarantees that those devs stay in business, those devs stay making games. And over the last 12 months, we've seen that is absolutely not the fucking case. Yeah. So I don't buy the argument anymore. First of all, I have to congratulate you on being the first one to swear. So uh, <laughs> you shall not be the last, but um, I am... I. I 
I'm my heart fills with pride. This, um, this will be when my daughter, when we recorded a podcast, which will come out next week, folks. And she mm-hmm. was like, I want to listen to some Prof and Dev Play Games episodes. I'm like, boy, no, I cuss in every single episode. And I think this episode may take the cake for the most cussing. Between I, you I don't and know. Me. We had we had a lot in our previous ones. And, uh, <laughs> just I, get us together and we'll just cuss a lot. I'm going to say I'm glad to know there isn't a swear jar that we have to pay into. So yes, yeah, $70 mm-hmm. per swear, didn't you hear? <laughs> Yikes. All right. <laughs> Um, but you see, this is also I. I also can actually add some uh, academic language to this now too, uh, because there's a, a debate I ended up having in my field with some people online about the way economics is used, and there was a in the 1920s uh, a raft of economists that want to tell historians how to write history. Mm. And there's this entire subfield called Cleo, uh, Cleometrics. And the idea that you could use economics to tell all history and nothing else was important. Oh, The problem with Cleometrics was that when you, in order to do a calculation, you have to make so many assumptions that it can be very tenuous. For example, in take inflation, for example, um, not all goods and services inflate at the same rate. Right. That's true. Um, and what was expensive at one point may no longer be because of things like economies of scale. Um, In American history, slavery studies, for example, we often try to explain uh, the quote-unquote cost of slavery in part by trying to say, okay, here's what a slave might cost at the Civil War, or right before, I should say, the antebellum period. What would that cost today? And far more smart people than I you still get a range between like twenty and forty thousand dollars. That's a big range, right? Right. Um, and unfortunately, you can make a set of presuppositions that feed into a narrative that suit your purposes. Um, for historians of slave studies, there's a book called Time on the Cross. Which tried to argue slavery was kind of good economically. Oh, Jesus Christ. Yeah. That's um, gross. heavily criticized study, yeah, uh, sure. as sure, you might sure, guess. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and came out at a particular time where you would expect that kind of thing to come out. Um, yeah. But you see, here's the thing that, like, extra credits did, and I think misses some of the point. If you just say, you know, if you only ingest inflation and only use the consumer costs of a base game, then the relative consumer cost of the base game has basically declined in relation to inflation. Mm-hmm. True, but uninteresting and also not very useful. Um, so, for example... We talked about a little bit two years ago, distribution and how much of that's changed. And in distribution, um, once you moved from physical media, where the percentage you got back as a developer was small, even the 30% cut of a theme mm-hmm. looks great by comparison. Um, the, uh, oftentimes people forget that there's a big change in, uh, like, for example, early on, they're talking about like the 1970s, right? Uh, one of the early games of the 1980s on computer, um, was a game called Mystery House. Are you familiar mm-hmm. with that one? No, I'm off to Google while you talk. <laughs> okay. Do you know uh, Sierra Online? Oh, yeah, Williams? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. 
that's their first game. Oh, wow. It's considered the first graphical adventure popularly. Um, In 1982, it sold 10,000 units. Mm -hmm. The cost, $24. To make or to buy? To buy. Wow, okay. In 1999, Grand Theft Auto 2 ultimately started by selling 2 million copies Mm -hmm. and will ultimately reach 6 million copies. Yeah. In 2001, Grand Theft Auto 3, 14.5 million copies. Now, Grand Theft Auto 2 sold 600 times more than Mystery Mansion. Mm -hmm. There is no pricing in that $24 that would make up for the fact that even if you only got $1 profit for Grand Theft Auto 2, Mystery Mansion would never make this much money, ever. Right. Um, And so, one... The argument ignores the rapid scale and growth of gaming. Um, It's just not there. The other problem is that, as was pointed out before, companies are also hiding the ultimate cost of a game by rapid monetization. Yep. Mm -hmm. The season passed. The five tiers of the game in order to get the full experience. Right. Um, And even things we say, well, they're just cosmetics. That's an argument that I feel a little uncomfortable with. I mean, obviously, cosmetics are less ugly than particularly multiplayer games than things that give you advantage in the game, right? Right, yeah. But, I mean, what's more the reason people play, like, The Sims? It's all cosmetics. The DLC for cosmetics, people also say, well, this isn't so bad because it's only cosmetics. Yeah. But... A lot of games, what are you trying to... I mean, people grind for gear, not, I mean, just for the function, but because it looks good. Right. Um, and some games, it's not about function at all. It's about looking good. It's about style. <laughs> yeah. And that is a reward. And... I don't think we should be pretending that those rewards are not part of gameplay and not part of the design when we think about monetization. Well, it's certainly part of the desire design where they're wanting you to want it, even if it doesn't necessarily change how much damage you do or whatever. Um, Yeah, but I mean, even the damage to do what, let's say they put on a mechanic that adds fire their attack. Yeah. Maybe it does more damage, but maybe already has a bleed attack. Yeah. Um is it then really an advantage or is it a cosmetic? Right. Um well I think it, it's complicated too. I mean it's not complicated, but I think about the, the entire time you've been talking to him, I think about Helldivers 2, and I'm not sure if you've played Helldivers 2. But no, you may... I, I haven't. People have asked me to, but that's why I didn't jump on yet. I love it. It's really great. Um it's, I just love playing with my friends. But the thing that's interesting is their battle. It's not a battle. I guess it is a battle pass. It, it's a uh, for, war bond is what they call it. And then you open it up with in-game currency, which you can buy for real world money or just grind to get it. And it's pretty easy to grind for it. But anyway, as you are unlocking new stuff within each of those war bonds, the items do different damage. So it's it's not really like pay to win, but it's a lot more than just cosmetic, which has mm-hmm. always surprised me in this game because no one has called it pay to win, but it's certainly those weapons that you are unlocking through that battle pass, for, you know, for lack of a better term, that you can only get through buying it does do different damage, does do different stuff, and it's not just cosmetic. Now, I know there was some huge 
hue and cry about Cold Divers 2 recently with Sony. That was with the PSN where they're like, we're going to make you do the PSN login on Steam now. And oh, by the way, you can't have PSN network in like 170 countries. And Steam said, all right, we'll just refund all those games. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then Sony was like, never mind, never mind. We take it back. We take it back. But then further, Ghost of Tsushima is coming out soon. And it does not require PSN for a single player, but it does require it for the multiplayer component. And then Steve, Steam just automatically started refunding in those countries where you cannot have PSN. So Sony lost out on a lot of fucking sales because they they don't quite understand the PC market. And they really want to juice their PSN active users number to the right. detriment of actually selling fucking games on the computer or on PC. So. Yeah, I have to say the uh, C-suite people are rarely also game players. Boy, my God. The last two weeks. I mean, we've seen it many times before, but, man, the last two weeks are like a case study in how that is true. (laughs) Yeah, but, I mean, you don't have to go that. I mean, you can. We saw that originally when, um, oh, dear. Is it John Scully who came Ah. from PepsiCo, Mm. took over Apple and basically nearly bankrupted it? Because they didn't understand their product? Yeah, no, because yeah. he, he yeah. just wasn't. And that's what caused, at the at the time, Steve Jobs had been exiled and was doing the next computer, right. but was Come also back. working on, oh, I don't know, this Hollywood thing he was dabbling with, right? <laughs> and um, that was the, the failure of Scully is what brought Jobs back. Right. Um, and so... There is, unfortunately, a kind of business philosophy that a widget is a widget is a widget. Yeah. And if you have a skill in business, it always translates without really knowing your widget. And I think, Mm -hmm. and not to, again, get too far into what we do, we've seen that in education as well. Oh, yeah. Education is treated as a widget without people knowing what a classroom is like and to the detriment of the student and the school. Yeah, and I feel like in in our field, there's two layers of it. One is certainly that, like, I I know widgets, I can come in and do this widget, but also I... I was successful as a CEO in a different arena, so I can definitely be successful as a CEO here. And it's like, this is a completely different world. And if you don't know it, your ass is shown pretty quickly. So. Yeah. Um, before we um, <laughs> get, before we get back to um, well, I'm going to bring it back to extra credits because I'm I'm looking at the credit I'm looking at the credit section of this extra credits video and it's their uh, sponsor is Factor Meals. <laughs> yes. And, mm-hmm. and, oh God damn it! The video just changed. Fuck. Uh, I want to find this fucking comment. Um, where did it go? God damn it. Um, okay, I'm just going to paraphrase it. It was someone who said, the only thing I've learned from this is that uh, factor meals cause brain damage. Because <laughs> uh, apparently, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> apparently you've been eating your own. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. again, I, um, in my uh, little letter that I sent to them privately, yeah, I, I also made a uh, a rude comment just saying, you know, as Mike Yabara would say, if you find my comment valuable, maybe I can get a tip jar of ten or twenty dollars. Oh my God, Mike Ibarra! So, Mike Ibarra! Uh, like, for, boy, tone deaf in the last few weeks. I mean, he was, I'm sure, before, but boy, that tip, <laughs> the, t- yep. the tip comment, as if the money would go to the developers. And then after this whole Xbox thing, where he's like, think about, think about Phil Spencer and how he feels when he has to lay people off. It's like, fuck off, man. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I, just as one other quick little fun. Uh, Because, again, you know me, I like to do research. Um, I pulled out an uh, amortization uh, calculator for adjusting for inflation. Mm -hmm. Uh, The gross return on Mystery Mansion was $782,000 adjusted for inflation today. Wow. Dang. In 2021... Bobby Kotick ugh, ugh. received eight hundred twenty-six thousand dollars and what eight hundred twenty-six five hundred forty-nine thousand dollars, as reported by the Wall Street Journal, for the upfront compensation without considering the stock options and everything else. Wait, less than a million dollars? That's when he cut his salary. Oh, got it. I see. Yeah. 
Right. So, again, just a little food for thought when we're thinking about that phrase, adjusted for inflation. So. Yeah, I appreciate you bringing up Bobby Kotick. Because, <laughs> again, in the last few weeks with Xbox, the one true winner of the entire Xbox thing was Bobby Kotick, who got like a, you know, $39 billion payout or whatever. Uh, whereas yeah. these devs are losing their jobs and, you know. It's not good. What a mess. <laughs> what a mess. That's that's for, that's for sure. Um, so I guess the, the argument, the full argument that you're making is that games, are you, are you saying that games should be exploring a scale? That the idea that uh, carrying well, I, water for the $70 game price Well, is, here's the thing. If, if the argument is games should cost more, mm-hmm. then you should be saying because blank. Yes. If you're saying games should cost more because more value will be put in the game. Yeah. Or the argument normally is because development costs have gone up. Right. That's right. But that's not true because we know uh, that certainly individual developers and programmers and, God forbid, quality assurance testers are not being paid more. (laughs) They're not, um, I, and I think I th- there is certainly proof that game development has gotten more expensive for a narrow sliver of games, perhaps. Certainly for AAA. Yeah, and, and even and in, and even narrower than that, I think some AAA versus yeah. others that maybe are not. Yeah, but also it's interesting where you know I go back to uh, Red Dead Redemption Two and horseball physics. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. You like know, how necessary um, was that kind of thing? Yeah, and, and you yeah. have to think of what kind of programming time was placed on something like that versus core systems. Right. And also, if you're going to say 70 is the new normal, then you need to say, well, what what is actually normal already if you include DLC... Right. First day FOMO, mm-hmm. uh, get the full story, microtransactions. Right. In which case, the full game is never seventy dollars for AAA anymore. It's always more. Right. Yeah. So, like the full the full cost to the end user is is certainly more yeah. than that. So if they want to lower the cost to seventy dollars as a package, hell yeah. You know, well, but that that's was part not of the, what's really going on. Absolutely not. And that was part of the argument, not our argument, but that was part of the argument when that was happening on a lot of podcasts where it's like, OK, are you if you're going to raise it ten dollars, are you going to cut out the fucking microtransactions shit? And that did, but nobody they, ever did. believed that. I, you know, no, I, no, you no, no, nobody said that. All that. They all said, oh, but that isn't going to happen. Uh, no, and I don't think any developer said that either, though. No, no. Or a publisher, I should say. But I think the fact that. um because the publisher never talks about the alternate streams of revenue. No, of course not. Why would they want to? Yeah. So why would they want I, to be um, honest? Why would they yeah. want to be honest? I feel like you know. Again, I keep coming back to the Xbox thing, but like for a while there was like a veneer of like uh, trustworthiness coming from uh, you know uh, Phil Spencer and Sarah Bond specifically that has just been completely destroyed to the point where it's like they were never telling the truth in the first place. And why would you believe exact? Why would you believe C Suite ever? Yeah. Um, so I'm back on on that that train, and the, the, the you're right, and I think the the seventy dollar argument is as a necessity is different for the reasons you mentioned, and just looking at this year where you've got the biggest game, Hell Divers, forty dollars, Pal World, twenty five dollars, um, what this week, um, Little Kitty Big City, twenty five dollars, um, a lot of these games that are blowing up and maybe little kitty big city is not blowing up but it's selling decently um they are at much lower price points and hades 2 hate thank you yes perfect yeah hades 2 30 dollars which just absolutely exploded um when they shadow dropped on monday and it's been quite a good time (laughs) yes (laughs) it just feels like more hades but like just different just a different flavor it's really great yeah so yeah i I agree. I agree with you, and I also agree with your um, vitriol is the wrong word. <laughs> but when we were when we were lodging the argument a couple of years ago, you're basically like, "What the fuck?" <laughs> um, and now I I I agree. What the fuck? Oh well, thank you. Well, yeah. um, 
And again, I can't claim that my perspective is unique. Uh, I still want to oh, yeah, sure. give nods out to those who, even if somewhat bombastically and slightly less academically, have argued, like, uh, again, uh, Stephanie Sterling mm-hmm. of uh, Jimquisition right. remains, um, you know, kind of on the forefront of that. And although I don't always agree with all of her hot takes, I think she's been very influential in reminding me of some of the data, particularly in terms of executive compensation or uh, abuses in the industry, which I wouldn't otherwise be aware of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. All right. Do you feel like you've properly exercised that topic? Oh, more more than that. The the, the boil has been lanced. (laughs) Awesome. I am curious. Uh, We had talked before uh, earlier this week that you had a game. Do you have a game? Do I do you have, have a game? game? You, I think you mentioned like wanting to play a game where you were going to name a couple of games that perhaps. Oh, you yeah. Play. yeah. Oh, so I, I did have an idea since it has been two years <laughs> since we've talked. Now, some of this might be easier than others because you should know some of them. But um, so we can, there's two versions of this game. I can name three games. And you can either name the one I didn't play or name the one I did play. Or we can play a version of uh, Mary Fuck Kill. Or if you're Henry VIII, um, that's uh, uh, Bed, Wed, or Behead. (laughs) Um, But in which of these games are ones that I either completed that I played a lot of but didn't complete or ones that I barely played at all. Okay. So, so those are three versions of the game. Okay. So I'm going to write that down or never played. Got it. I am interested in, in the nuance of completed, barely played, and never played. I think it's okay. more difficult for me and maybe for you too. <laughs> well, then let me let me Put these together. Okay, I will start with um I will start with a complicated set of three. Okay. Um I'm trying to find games that are gr- dissimilar I- so they'll be more intriguing to talk I gra- about. I grabbed a notebook to take notes. Okay. <laughs> and it's got work notes, so I'm going to turn the page. <laughs> okay. And so I will put the read these in alphabetical order. Uh, for our first uh, MFK, we'll call it, um, Danganronpa, Resident Evil 4, the remake, and Saints Row, the most recent iteration of Saints Row. <sighs> that just okay. came out. Uh, so of that list, I think it's easy to figure out which one you completed, which one you barely played, and which one you never played. And okay. I'm worried that that means I'm wrong. <laughs> um, well, you, you talk it through. Let me hear it. But I'm going to go for it. I think having played Danganronpa for many hours but never completed by myself, that feels like a you game. So mm-hmm. I'm going to say that you completed Danganronpa. Mm-hmm. I feel like Saints Row is a game that you would have a lot of fun with, but I'm not sure that's a you game, and I could be completely wrong on this one. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I'm going to say that that's a barely played, Mm -hmm. and I think you have not played RE4 Remake. Uh, So you get one out of three. God damn it. (laughs) The question is, can you now, knowing it's one out of three... Guess which one you got correct. I think that you've completed Saints Row and barely played Danganronpa. Uh, yeah, well, so it, it's actually completed Saints Row. Yep. Played a lot of Danganronpa, barely touched Resident Evil 4. Oh, I, I wrote completed, barely played, never played. So we're doing yeah. it's completed, played a lot, and... Or barely, barely or never played. Oh, yeah. uh, okay. Got it, got it, got it, got it. Okay. So, for example, I might have something open for a while, played it, and then... 
Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so that makes sense. Yeah, because as soon as I was talking through it, I'm like, you know what? Actually, I think Saints Row is a game that Bill probably played a lot of. <laughs> yeah, I played. Um, I finished both uh, three and four. Um, though I never played Gat out of Hell. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I did play. Uh, so when the new one came out, I played it to completion and a lot of side stuff. I won't say a hundred percent of it because you know there's a lot of many games yeah, in there. Sure. Um, Danganronpa, I got pretty far into, and then it's one of those where something else got in the way, took a break, and then it's like, oh, there's another round of courtroom drama I need to do, and now I may have lost the thread. Mm -hmm. Um, it's one I will come back to, so, but it is very much my game. And Resident Evil 4 started it, it was cool, but it didn't quite hit my buttons. Yeah. So. I can see that one not hitting your buttons, that's for sure. Yep. Okay, cool. So that's round one. Love those. Um, okay. Here's a... Uh, let me see if I can find... And some of the... Well, okay, let me... Hold that one... That one... Okay. Um... Let me get these in order. Shuffle Puck Cantina Deluxe. Shuffle Puck is the first one. Mm hmm. Cantina Deluxe. And I should let the listeners know if they're hearing some slurring, it's not because I'm either having too many alcohol or uh, a uh, seizure. I unfortunately had some bad dental surgery that is having to be repaired, so I'm, I'm occasionally slurring, so. Thank you all for your um, kindness. Uh, Shadow Warrior 3 and Tales from the Borderlands. Okay, so let's see here. Um, Tales from the Borderlands. So I think I have more games here than I think I need. Tales from the Borderlands. Tales from the Borderlands. You said Cantina Deluxe or is it Shuffle Puck? Shuffle Cantina? Puck Cantina Deluxe. Got it. Okay, that's where I got confused. It's all one word. Oh, okay. one game, I'm sorry. Well, one game. Tales from the Borderlands. And then the middle one I missed was... Uh, Shadow Warrior 3. Okay, Shadow Warrior 3. So, I think that... I think that you played Shadow Warrior 3 to completion. Okay. I think that you... Ooh, the next one's... Hmm. I think Tales from the Borderlands is no that wouldn't make sense um, I think Shuffle Puck is played a lot and T- Tales from the Borderlands is barely played okay um, and uh, so I finish Shuffle Puck ah fuck I am medium through Shadow Warrior 3 and just started Tales from the Borderlands, but did not go further in it. So I'm basically one for three on both. <laughs> yeah, so, so far, far so good. <laughs> um, uh, Shuffle Puck is one of my, although it, it took forever, it's one of my go-to little arcade games. Quite mm-hmm. fun. Uh, Shadow Warrior 3 is surprisingly good for a franchise that started out as a racist piece of shit. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Because the original one was, I, I, I'm sure you know, was a uh, racist Duke Nukem and it's a racial variation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But the remakes are really beautiful. And um, uh, the main character is more kind of dude bro, not, you know, trying to be snarky, not particularly funny, but not the worst. Um, right. Cool. Is Shuffle, right. Puck, is Shuffle Puck fucking air hockey? Yeah, but oh. it's um, Whoa, cool. but it's also um, but it's air hockey with like alien pucks and alien. So as you beat the aliens, you unlock uh, special uh, pucks and other things. And as you move back and forth with the air hockey, things appear on the board for power ups. So. That's very cool. I'm seeing here it's VR, but it's also fun. I've never played it VR, but yeah, it, it's okay. a great game. 
That's very cool. I'm going to add that to the wish list. I'm not going to commit to anything to be held to account. No, no. I, I, <laughs> just want to give you a hard time about that. It does song. look cool. It does look cool, though. Yeah. Okay. Um, here's one that should be interesting. Um, Grift Lands. Mm-hmm. Outer Worlds. Mm-hmm. And Persona 5. Okay. <laughs> so it's outer worlds and not outer wilds, right? Yes, worlds. Okay. Mm-hmm. Talk it through. Let's hear it. So I'm initially thinking Persona Five. I'm highlighting because I know you played other Personas, but mm-hmm. I'm thinking in terms of percentage chance that you've completed it. Just because it's so fucking long, yeah, it's it possible that you played a lot but didn't complete it. That's what I'm thinking there. I'm thinking Griftlands is shorter. So is Outer Worlds, to be honest. Um, Outer Worlds feels like, if I if I remember correctly, you've played a lot of Fallout games. Um, maybe I'm wrong about that, but I thought you had. Um, so if you had, it seems natural that you would check out Outer Worlds and maybe complete it, because it's a pretty short game. It's like a 20-hour game, I think. But Griftlands is an indie game, if I remember correctly, so that could be short as well, and feels like... I feel like when I think of you, I think of indie games. So this mm-hmm. is probably something that you checked out. Griftlands um, is a uh, roguelite uh, deck builder. Aha, uh-huh. and it's by the peep. It's by Clay. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So... <laughs> I think you completed Griftlands. Mm-hmm. I think you played a lot. Oh, fuck. <clears throat> uh, I'm thinking I might be playing myself on Persona 5 and that you were disappointed in a previous Persona and maybe didn't pick up 5, um, but that you probably played a lot of Outer Worlds. So I'm going to go complete Griftlands. I'm going to say you played a lot of Outer Worlds and that you have barely played Persona 5. Okay. Uh, again, I love your logic. Oh, shit. Um, no, no, no. Again, one out of five. Um, completed <laughs> Outer Worlds. Mm. Griftlands is a little tricky because I did get one completed run, but to finish it, there's like multiple characters and I haven't really unlocked or done most of them. So that's what I call mostly played. Uh, and Persona 5, I. I mean, there were problems I had with Persona 4, but I also played the fuck out of it. Yeah, right. And finished it completely. Um, And Persona 5, it's just been a question of knowing the time commitment for it. Yes, exactly. Um, So... Well, but my logic I, there was right. <laughs> yeah, no, the logic was great. I I loved Outer Worlds. I think that people who do want... uh, Fallout like experience, particularly now that Fallout is on TV. Um, Outer Worlds is a great feel of that. Um, it's a shorter experience, but it, it definitely has that kind of feel of that kind of world, but in space. Um, Griftlands is an amazing uh, roguelike deck builder. Uh, I don't know if you played it or not, but it, it's no, I haven't. No, I have not. yeah. Um, and Persona Five, I'll find out someday. <laughs> so you own it, I think. On oh yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. I own it on both PS4 and yeah. on PC. Yeah. So. Damn, man, I've oof, been so close to getting yep. three at three on any of these, but no. Okay. Okay, so. Um, Here's three that'll be interesting. Evil Genius 2. Mm-hmm. Encased, E-N-C-A-S-E-D. And Starfield. Ooh, that is interesting. Okay. Because um, we were I, just mentioning Fallout likes. Yeah. <laughs> I immediately think that Evil Genius 2 is a game that you either played a lot of or completed because I know that you are very excited about that coming out. Mm-hmm. Um, I have no idea what the fuck Encased is. Go look at it. It's interesting. Encased. And then Starfield, we haven't talked about that at all, and I thought we would have mm-hmm. since it came out. Um, Encased is a sci-fi post-apocalyptic RPG that looks like it's very much your shit. Um... Yes, it does. 
It looks like Baldur's Gate 3 in terms of like a CRPG. Um, seems very much your shit. Um, I'm not going to go down and see how many hours you played. I'm just going to base it on. <laughs> Fair enough. I'm going to base it on what it looks like. Um, almost Fallout esque in terms of like Fallout 2, Fallout 1. Um, yeah, um, it's it's an interesting setup in the idea that um, there's a uh, there's a tunneling to a core of a world where resources are in a world that has scarcity. And so handfuls of volunteers are sent down this great elevator to develop the resources in a society to help the world above. And then something happens to the world above and they're cut off from the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And so a whole new kind of post-apocalyptic inner world, that's why it's encased, um, is there as they try to figure out are they trying to build their own society? Do they want to live in a matrix-like thing? Do they want to go back to the surface? What What's their goal? This looks like one you completed or one you played a lot. So I'm going to kick it off of the didn't play at all. So, fuck. Um... This could be a one out of three or a three out of three, because I think I don't think you played Starfield very much. Mm. I think we would have talked about it at some point because it came out in September or so. Um, but we've had many, 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 many other things to talk about in the last right. fucking eight months. So who the hell knows if that's good logic or not? I, I God, I feel like I feel like we talked at one point that you were excited about Evil Genius 2 and then you were ultimately disappointed with it. And I wonder if I'm remembering that correctly. Um, but I'm still, I'm going to go with you. Let's, let's do it. I'm going to go with you completed encased. I'm going to go with you played a lot of Evil Genius 2 and that you barely touched Starfield. One out of three. God damn it. <laughs> God damn it, man. But again, close. Your fuck, logic is fuck, good, except... Fuck. I did finish Evil Genius 2 uh, um, more than once on different mechanisms. Okay, okay. But I was disappointed by, again, it, it, it's so close, but no cigar. Yeah. Um, Encased was one that I got really far in, but then it soon became apparent that um, the factions were all kind of dulcetory. And that became, it's kind of like, eh, this just feels kind of ick no matter what I do. And I kind of fell off it, though I love the mechanisms of it. It's great. I I logged a lot of hours. In fact, uh, let me see. I don't remember how many now, but a lot. Um, Mm -hmm. But, um, and then uh, Starfield, I got a little way into it, found the weight limitations, and (laughs) noped out. (laughs) <laughs> and said, you know, yeah. there will be mods for that later. Yep. When it becomes a good game, I'll play it. Well, I think this the new update that came out last week got rid of the um encumbrance, if I remember correctly. So Okay. But I'm sure mods had it well. God damn it. I was so close on that one. You so were. Close. You did oh. great. <laughs> okay. Here's one that you have a little information on, so it may give you um, a leg up, perhaps. Okay, okay. The one that's very well known, Tiny Tina's Wonderlands. Oh, yeah, okay. A game called Storyteller. Oh, yeah, uh-huh. And On Guard. Ah, okay. <sighs> okay, so Tiny Tina's Wonderland is the D&D-ish... Uh, Ashley Birch's character is telling like a story yeah. within the mm-hmm. world that feels a little bit like a D&D campaign. Storyteller is the one where it's like a comic book that is mm-hmm. being told and you're kind of, it's like a puzzle game, I think, where you're yes. setting up mm-hmm. the frames in different ways. And then Engard obviously is the um, third person action game where you're playing mm-hmm. as a female uh, fucking... Zoro-like character. Yes, exactly. Now you know at least I've played 
at least some of On Guard. So, I do, yes. I, I recommended it heavily. Yes, and it was a great recommendation, and I wish I remembered if you had finished it. <laughs> <laughs> I, of, fuck me, of these, I know how much you like D&D, so I mm. feel like Tiny Tina's is something that you would be interested in and start playing and either like what they're doing with that or hate what they're doing with that. Um, and that could influence whether or not you finished it. Storyteller is a shortish indie puzzler mm-hmm. that I can see you dabbling with and moving on or dabbling with and getting into, and finishing. And guard, did you fucking finish and guard? Um, <laughs> fuck. I think you fuck. Um, I think the way that you were enthusiastically talking about and guard is mm-hmm. either tells me you finished it or you knew that my daughter would really like it, which was true. Um, or it could be both. Or it could be both. Yeah. <laughs> I've never heard you talk about storyteller, <laughs> uh, but that doesn't ma- fucking matter. I never heard you talk about encased and you played a shit ton of it. Um, mm, 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 mm. Is this the one that I get zero out of three? Let's find out. I think that you. Okay, so in the past, I did what I thought was logically right, and I've gotten one out of three, so I'm going to flip this. I mm-hmm. think that you completed Tiny Tina's Wonderland. Mm-hmm. I think that you played a lot of Engar but didn't finish it, mm-hmm. and I think you barely touched Storyteller, which is the opposite of what I wanted to do. Which what would you have wanted to do? I would have flipped Tiny Tina's and Engard. And put okay. completed and guard and did a lot of tiny Tina's, but okay. I'm gonna stick it. I'm gonna stick with tiny Tina, tiny Tina's. You completed storyteller, barely played, and and guard a lot of. Okay, well you're consistent. Oh man, at one out of three, <laughs> but had you flipped it, it would have been zero out of three. Oh, okay. Well, I'm glad I flipped so, it. So, yeah. Um, okay. On guard, I got so close, but at the very end. I kept screwing up the final boss battle Mm. and then I thought, okay, I'm going to come back to it. And I didn't because I also knew that was it, you know, to the game. Yeah, sure, sure. And I really enjoyed it, but, uh, you know, I I played a lot of it and I was okay to let it go. Storyteller loved, and of course it was also short and I blew through it. Okay, Um, okay. What a great little game. Very, um, the characters are very Shakespearean. It's very Mm -hmm. similar to... um, is it framed is the name of the game where you have to put the storybook things in order? Uh, the I cartoon don't, panels. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know that one. Yeah. And so it it's very clever and quite funny um, and a little brain tingly, but fun. It's and one then, that I wanted to play with my daughter. I thought it would yeah. be, but I, I wasn't sure if it would be appropriate it's uh there's some death and some yeah a lot well there's a lot of comic dying Mm. and there's things about like maybe infidelity and all that which might not be appropriate yeah that's Um, why i didn't ultimately do it because i see that it's t for teen i was like no i'm good yeah uh tiny teens i was super excited by um i had played the dlc in borderlands 2 Mm -hmm. loved it played all the way through my husband and I started uh, Tiny Tina's, and it just didn't grab me. I was yeah. very disappointed. It was okay, but it just felt more of less of the same, and it just didn't take off. So that was kind of sad. Well, at least my logic was right that I oh, no, it could be something mm-hmm. that you loved or that you just didn't get on with. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Let me. Uh, let me once again. Are, are you okay with the game? Do you want to continue? I Do love you want this. To this is, okay. I, I will fucking play this until I get a three out of three. We could be your home fucking night. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, here, here is um, here's the tricky one. Okay. My time at Sandrock. Uh huh. Like a dragon, infinite wealth. Uh huh. Midnight suns. Okay. Okay. Mm, I th- I'm thinking Midnight or my time at Sandrock is a difficult game to finish, but that's definitely a game that you would 
have played a lot of. I remember, I think I remember talking. I will you... say because you have some information. Mm-hmm. Um, I have played the Like the Dragon series. Yep. And I have played this the prequel to My Time at Sandrock. Mm-hmm. And uh, which was My Time at Porsche. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, of course, Midnight Suns is a game that you can see is very much my kind of game. Oh yeah. So this is a has a little bit of tricky to us, but again, you have one piece of information probably. Yeah. Already. So my, for me, you, I don't think My Time at Sandrock is a game that's easy to complete. It came out recently. It was a sequel to My Time at Porsche. I know you loved My Time at Porsche. Mm -hmm. I know that people who loved My Time at Porsche did not like My Time at Sandrock very much. Mm -hmm. So I'm leaning on that to think that that's probably one that you... Ah, fuck. Either barely played Mm -hmm. or played a lot of, like, hate played. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Like a Dragon Mm -hmm. Infinite Wealth came out this year. Came out in February-ish. It's a long-ass motherfucking game. That it Um, is. If I remember correctly, you really liked... um, Yakuza Like a Dragon. Mm-hmm. Um, but I could be inventing that memory because I've heard so many people talk about how much they like that game. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like Midnight Suns is one that you would have finished. It's a it's mm-hmm. a the, the property that you would like. It's it's the card. It's the tactics. I feel like that's one that you would have completed. I think that Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth is one that you would have played a lot. And My Time at Sandrock is one that you would have played and said, you know what, this is not hitting the way that Porsche did. So I'm going to go with that. You completed Midnight Suns. You played a lot of Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth, and you barely touched my time at Sandrock. And I'm hesitating slightly because only because Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth came out this this semester. Mm -hmm. Yes, and you know, you have other information as well. (laughs) Yeah, in February, it's been a fraught semester for everybody, but especially you. Um, did you? I don't think you would have played like a dragon infinite wealth a lot in the last couple of months compared to playing my time at Sandrock, which could be a kind of shut your brain off and kind of relax. But then you have better games than that to do that with. <sighs> I fuck me. I'm gonna stick with this. I'm gonna stick with Midnight Suns is completed. Like a dragon infinite wealth, you played a lot, and my time at Sandrock, you barely touched. Okay, so I'm going to let you cheat a little bit. That's your final answer, right? Well, now that you're saying that, I no, don't no, want no, to no, be. I think there should be, but here's <laughs> but the thing. It, it I is, want you is. to, can yeah. you look under my profile on okay. Steam? Okay. Uh, me... Because then you can look under my games. Okay, let me go do that. And in my games list, uh, under find a game, pull up uh, like a dragon. Okay, games... And then find a game. I'm going to do Like a Dragon. Holy mother fuck. <laughs> Holy fuck. <laughs> Man, I was so wrong. Yeah, so now wrong. mind you, no, but you weren't because Midnight Suns I've completed. Yes. Like a Dragon I have done a lot of, yes. and I never played Sandra. God damn it, I got three out of three three finally. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm so happy. For the listeners, uh, he has 250 hours in Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth. Some may be idle time, but Jesus Christ. Well, Um, part of the thing is that I find (laughs) when uh, I'm frustrated with... So I got to the point where they have the the dungeons. Mm -hmm. And so what I often do is when I have... um, Because of things that were going on at school, I had some nights I couldn't sleep. And so I would go into the dungeons and listen to either an audio book or a a video of some sort and grind through a dungeon. Okay. Uh, Because I like to, I like to have all the characters have at least 30 levels of all the classes. Right. Which is dumb, but. Because you can't even inherit all the skills from all of them. But, yeah. Well, it's a game you like to play. Man, I finally did it. I finally did it. Yay! (laughs) So you didn't even touch My Time at Sandrock. No, because My Time at Porsche Mm -hmm. was brilliant, but never completed and a bit broken. Mm -hmm. And when I bought Sandrock, 
it was still early development. And I never heard the negative on that, but I never heard that they really got it in a state of completion. Right. And to me, because in Porsche, they left some questions open. I didn't feel like I wanted to go into that one. And then, uh, since you now have won the game, I don't, we don't have to do any more if you don't want to. Um, but I had other cozy games that took its place. Mm. So. See, and that's what made sense to me is that I don't think you would waste your time with a game that fans of the previous one didn't like very much when you have a bunch of other cozy games that are much better. Yeah. So, ah, uh, yes, I finally logic this out. <laughs> I, I feel very accomplished. <laughs> But why don't we talk about what you've been playing, then we can, however long you want to, I can go down this awful list of yeah, crazy so let, stuff I have. <laughs> yeah, so mine, let me go to my profile. Mine's going to be pretty short because, as listeners know, I've been playing a ton of Final Fantasy twelve. so if you tune into the RPG Backlog podcast, you'll, you know, you'll hear all about that. I put 53 hours into that game, basically from... Sometime, sometime in March, and we finished last weekend. And I was playing through that with a friend, and that was a really good, really good experience. So I'm hoping, I think I talked to you about it. If you find an RPG on your backlog, we can mm-hmm. dig into that. Um, I played about two hours of Hades 2, which has felt like putting on like a an, uh, you know, well-worn pair of jeans. It's like, mm-hmm. It feels like Hades. I got to Hecate and lost to her the first time and barely lost to her. And then got to her again and beat her the second time when uh, in Hades one, I think the first quote unquote boss or whatever I got to, um, I lost to like 20 or 30 times. Whereas Mm -hmm. this one until I upgraded enough, but this one I didn't need to upgrade. I just need to play smarter. Um, And I did. So I feel, I feel way more prepared to be a player of Hades two than I was a player of Hades Mm one. Hades one. I did early access. Um, on Epic and probably put like an hour into it and didn't touch it again until release. This one I'm going to play through, but I don't feel the need to, for it to be the game I'm playing right now. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm just going to dip in and out. Um, The game that I'm playing right now, and I don't know if you've heard of this one, it's 1000X Resist. No. Uh, So this is one that just came out. um, On platform? I'm playing on uh, Steam. Okay. I'm, Mm -hmm. I'm like heavy into my Steam deck right now. Um, a thousand X resist is a thrilling sci-fi adventure. The year is unknown and a disease spread by an alien invasion keeps you underground. You are a watcher. You dutifully fulfill your mission in serving the all mother until the day you discover a shocking secret that changes everything. Um, and it's basically a time jump, uh, visual novel with some Ooh. light platforming with some really good writing, um, really interesting thoughts about, <sighs> the pandemic but also mm-hmm. about being part of a diaspora um and assimilation and helping others assimilate or not and it's it's really interesting uh from that vein so i heard it in a podcast and i checked out a couple uh news articles and i was like this is i want to be on the ground floor of mm-hmm. this one so i've been playing that one and i've uh since final fantasy 12 actually been much better and this was just recent of course but like sticking with something like i stuck with final fantasy 12 for 52 hours over the course mm-hmm. of two months and i never do that so uh this is a i think by all accounts is like an 11 or 12 hour game well so i'm, I'm really... also amazed by the fact that because although it's been on my list to play um this is by the people that did uh paradise killer right so is that fellow traveler or is that by the who is the publisher or is it by oh, the, the publisher okay yeah, so fellow traveler has done a lot of stuff in this vein yeah um, so Kraken academy traveler. that's another one that i've mm-hmm. I, i'm amazed I, when i look at this how many of these are in my library <laughs> i was gonna say i bet you have a ton in your library and so do i i have suzerain mm-hmm. um which i think is that what you just said um paradise oh, killer yeah, here framed that was the one i was talking about earlier ah. that's also published by them for oh, two bucks yep, there it is. That's oh i have great... frame i fucking have yeah. frame there yeah that's a, yeah yeah that's an awesome oh yeah very cool okay oh it's a steam deck verified hello yeah um, it, it's it's a fun little again just like um story uh teller it, it's very clever so 
Yeah, so the uh, fellow traveler is, I think, one of the co-sponsors of the Ludo Naricon that's happening right now on Steam. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I've, I've, you know, circled around several games that looked really cool, and I was like, oh, they're all published by you. And I now I see now I see a theme with this publisher, and I'm liking this theme. So that's oh, what yeah. I've been playing. Um, other than with my daughter, we've been playing Age of Calamity, which is a hack and slash Muso Zelda game, and she's okay. obsessed with it. <laughs> and she gets we're like in like late game now we're like it's fucking hard uh but she refuses to go to like the smaller missions to kind of level up mm-hmm. and we're instead kind of hitting the missions at level and you really need to be over leveled because you know we're getting to a place in this level where it's like here's here's three bosses you have to fight at the same time and when you do then five bosses come out when you beat them then 12 bosses come out and it's like it's really insane how hard it is mm-hmm. so my daughter gets like you know, three fourths of the way through, burns all of her resources and can't do it. It's like, here, can you do it for me? So I've got to do it with no resources. Oh no! Um, and it's just like, boy, this is fucking hard. Um, I would like to back out and level the fuck up, but I don't have an, uh, the ability to do that because I'm stuck in the middle of your playthrough. So that I've been playing that with her. Um, and other than that, that's that's what I've been playing. Um, so, okay, well, I have a bunch I could talk about. Do, would you like to hear? The ones that are like superb, I'd like to recommend. Would you like to hear the I awful would... ones that are kind of fun to talk about because they're awful? Um, <laughs> I kind of like all that, but I'd like to start. Let's start with the ones that you think are superb. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, I have to give a big shout out to one called Coral Island. Oh, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. That's a cozy game. And even though it's not complete, by any sense of the word, um, the amount that's complete is already very satisfying. Um, It takes a lot from, and by takes a lot from, in some cases, nearly, uh, I don't know that the word homage is correct, but it's nearly a ripoff of (laughs) uh, Stardew Valley, Uh of a lot of things that they do. But they have a lot of unique mechanics in it as well. And the big... um, appeal to this one one it's a again like a porsche it's a 3d kind of starter valley but it also has underwater mechanics is this the one with mer people yes yeah you eventually get and then they have and part of the thing is that there's a story so your town is now in a f grade might be shut down an oil company is trying to move in, so kind of like the JoJo storyline. But the thing is, underwater is polluted by the oil, and the oil company wants to drill more. And you will eventually start cleaning up the water and eventually unlock the Mer Village, and there's a whole history of the town that you begin to find out is a story between the Mer Village and the town itself. So um, they are putting in a summer update that includes being able to date the Mer people, mm-hmm. which is awesome. But again, joyous, fun, big thumbs up. I'm really looking forward to the update this summer. Um, Texarchy. This oh, is yeah. my go-to day to day. I cannot tell you how much I love this game. Um, this is a 4X, right? Yeah, it, it, it's a 4X in one hour or less. Ah, I love that. It's Civ, but Civ done as a deck builder. Mm-hmm. It is so good. Um, the free play game is fine, but with the daily challenges, and then they also have a, um, a thing where you have, like, uh, you have one Civ, and you play a game to get one goal, and then it links to another game with another goal. So there are five games you play in a row and try and make the leaderboard against other players for how few moves you make on all five, mm-hmm. for example. Um, just joyous and interesting and takes a little while to get used to some of the tech tree and part of part of the game is knowing when to burn a card 
Like, just get rid of it completely? Yeah, it gives mm-hmm. you a mild amount of resources, but if you burn, like, a tech and haven't played it and unlocked it, you'll never get it. Mm. But if there's, like, there's only, like, four... You know how you if you unlock the tech trees in the order? You might have two, like, um, hunter-gatherer and um, agriculture both sure. available. Mm-hmm. And if you do agriculture, then you unlock hunter gatherer. You block out all the cards that were in agriculture, and switch to only hunter gatherer. You will never be able to go back to agriculture for that one hour hand for that game. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's just intriguing. I, I really, I play probably once a day. I find it very calming to the brain that's cool i love that game so much um i did play power world Mm -hmm. for quite a bit um i'm okay with it now uh i think i like to see a little bit more of it on the meat and the bones yeah but um there's a lot of once you're building those production lines and uh it has a lot of collision detection and other problems that make it not fun when you're trying to build up and out. Um, so, uh, but it's a good game. Very good. Uh, Moonstone Island. Uh, Moonstone. Another cozy game. Mm-hmm. That is, what if uh, Stardew Valley and Pokemon met? I like that. <laughs> and so you're collecting spirits of the land, unlocking things, and then you are a witch, an alchemist, and you fly from the main island to all these subsidiary islands, which might be elementally based. And then depending on the time of night or certain conditions, if you collect your elementals and you carry some of them with you, Battles are common, but also some of them just might give you passive abilities in the world. So it, it's a very cool, it's not as well developed as um, Coral Island, it's a little rough around the edges. Mm-hmm. But definitely, if you have that Pokemon love, high, high praise for it. Um, across the Obelisk. Across the obelisk. That, oh my god. This why is that sound great. Familiar? Okay. Um it's <laughs> like Grifflands. Oh, it's yeah, a um it's a roguelike card battler. Um but you unlock lots of storylines in it, and it is so good. Oh my god. Um just a joy to play. Mm-hmm. They've added more uh, elements to it, um, but it's super addictive. Um, it's like an evolved Slate of Spire. Yeah, I'm looking at it. It looks like Slate of Spire mixed with um, Darkest Dungeon almost. Yeah, but more joyous than Darkest than, Thank Dungeon. Thank God. Thank God. Yeah, it's very light and fun. Mm-hmm. Um, highly recommend. Um Adding to and then finally, on the highly recommend, oh, I had one more. I was gonna. Let's see. Um. Oh. Uh. Though it's older now. Uh. Death Loop. Oh yeah. Was awesome. Love that game. Is that one that you played recently, or you played a while ago? Uh, in the last year. Okay. But I really, really got into it. Um, and that was um, Arcane Leone, I think. Yeah. Not. It, it was basically Dishonored Plus in some yep. ways. Mm-hmm. But man, a fun story. I think it was underappreciated when it came out. Definitely. I didn't play it until later, but I, I think it's an awesome, awesome game. Yeah, it was super underappreciated, but people who got into it really liked it. So Yeah. I should take so yeah, out. those would be it. And then uh, other ones I have are more like things like Fox in the Forest, a uh, 
implementation of a card game quite fun. Uh, so just a little simple. Fox and there's a, it. yeah, it's a, a a fun card game. And if you ever wanted to play a two player trick taking game, and I think you're uh, over the time, you you're going to have to learn the language. But uh, there's a two player version called Fox in the Forest Duet. Which is only for two players. Is it on Steam? Yeah. Are you saying Fox like F O X? F O X. Fox and the Force. In. Oh, in. No wonder I'm not fucking playing it. There I'm go. sorry. I'm no. That's sorry. me, not you. There we go. No, Fox it's, it's me. in the forest. Mm-hmm. Um, this is by Direwolf. Also, a very great little mobile game uh, implemented as well. Oh, this one's got only 17 reviews on Steam. This looks yeah. It's, cool. it's probably bought and played a lot more on like iOS. Oh, got it. Okay. Um, but the Fox in the Forest is one of the higher rated board game geeks, um, trick taking games. Oh, cool. And so uh, it's just a great little implementation of a simple but interesting trick taking game. That's very cool. Mm-hmm. I'll add that to my wish list as well. Yep. Cool. And obviously, I have to give one plug out to the complicated but awesome Potionomics. I was going to say, he's about to say Potionomics. You're right. <laughs> oh, that's great. Potionomics, which came yep. out in 2022, developed yep. by Voracious Games and published by X. I didn't realize it was published by X. Yep. Cool. Um, and then ultimately, uh, my ex student, um, Angel ended up getting uh, for one of the um, international boards an international uh, animators award for it. So well, that's interesting because I was about to say, "Wow, the art style looks gorgeous!" And then the no, it is. It is. Um, it's very I, fluid. It, to be very fair, it it looks like a cozy game, but it plays more like a really intense. Uh, game uh but there's a lot to unlock there's a lot of fun characters it's beautiful the music is insane the characterization is awesome but the systems are a little tight uh, well too tight to be honest and i think they it plays a little bit more roguelite and you don't realize that because it feels like this would be cozy Mm -hmm. um and so that's one where I know they've been working on an update that will make it um and you can have a more cozy option. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But um again, you know, sometimes you can only make as a small through the game that you're given the money to make. Yeah. Like, sure, of you course. Know. Um but I, I think it is such a brilliant accomplishment and amazing art. I mean, insane. I love some of the reviews on here, which are, I'll, I'll read a few. They mm-hmm. didn't have to go this hard on the animation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, short, simple game with great animations, cute characters, and romance all the hotties while making stacks. <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's great. Oh, man. Okay. Oh, crap. I'll give one more recommendation because I gave it to you, and your listeners should know I've been trying to bully you into playing this one. Which is Max Gentleman? Oh yeah, sexy business. Mm-hmm. Which is just insane. It's in my um, library. Yeah, it is. It's a premier. It's kind of a worker placement board game mm-hmm. with tons of colorful characters and sex, but also a roguelike storyline that opens up over time. And things that are not quite doki doki, but definitely colorful. Okay. Well, the premier Victorian business tycoon and dating simulator. There's a naked dude on a horse. I should play this game. That looks. Yep. Oh, they're <laughs> naked dudes, naked girls. the The character creator is the most diverse character, and you can actually put it on like a a prude setting, or you can have it where everything hangs out. And it will. <laughs> but <laughs> they're the but, ones that did Oregon Trail. I can't remember. They had a um they had another 
gentleman game before it. But they I don't did, know yeah. if they also did Oregon uh, Trail. But so. they did Oregon Trail, O R G A N Trail. Yeah, or, the Oregon yeah. Trail. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, fuck. Okay, that they came on my radar for that game a long time ago. It, um, if you play that game, look at there are so many flourishes on how they signal interface to that game that are superb. Okay. I mean, there's a there's a real brilliance of interface and design in it that, again, they shouldn't have gone as hard as they did. Mm-hmm. It was beautiful. I love that game. This is very cool. I'm going to check this out. Uh, I will check this out before next, next, well, not next week's, because next week's with my daughter. Uh, two weeks. <laughs> two weeks. Oh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, this looks really cool. Um, oh, and crap. I, and I'm I, sorry. I, one more. Yeah, go for it. Warhammer 40K. Oh, uh, which one? Uh, the the RPG, uh, Rogue Trader. Oh, yeah. Uh, Anthony awesome was talking about game. that. Yeah. Um, again, I got pretty far in it, and then it's like, okay. This is getting a little heavy. The semester is too heavy. I'll have to punt till later when I'm mm-hmm. ready to address it. You know? Yeah, I think so. Anthony jumped on that right when it came out last, uh, in December, I think is when it came out. Um, yeah, it's not my normal world, um, but yeah. it's fun. And um, I later found out a colleague of mine, it has a, a Warhammer thing going on, so that was very funny. Interesting. We'll have to talk yeah. off mic about that one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. It looks like Anthony's played five point eight hours, and you played two hundred and thirteen. So there's a little bit of discrepancy there. A small but... amount, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, but Alcat, they're the ones that did Pathfinder, so that's cool. Oh yeah, no, I love. This was their third game. They did the two Pathfinder games, and actually, they're um, they're wrapping up. Uh, a final DLC to, I think it's Wrath of the Righteous, mm. that lets you take the original party, and it's meant to be kind of a um, uh, a kind of like a Citadel expansion to the Mass mm. Effect yeah. Yeah. kind mm. of extra send off for your characters. So I'm That's looking cool. forward to that. Well, I I have fond memories of saying goodbye to my characters and. Mass Effect. Oh yeah! Oh my heart. <laughs> to Vitaly, who I fucking killed the the evening that Trump was elected. <laughs> oh no! Oh yeah, no, Tali. Yeah, I was. I was just. I just sat and played Mass Effect, and did not did not make good decisions. <laughs> and Tali did not survive. Well, that's okay. Uh, neither did a lot of people. That well, day. yes, exactly right. No. Exactly right. <laughs> exactly right. Kind of par for the course there. Yep. Well, awesome, Bill. Anything else before we wrap up the podcast? Um, don't waste your money on Illuminati. Is that a video game, or are you talking about the Illuminati? It's a video. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a video game adaptation of a Steve Jackson card game. I kicked started uh, it, mm-hmm. and my heart is full of regret. Oh, that um, sucks. And my pocket is empty of cash. Oh yeah, um, I see, yeah. I see here the reviews are pretty bad. Oh, and they they probably don't cover half of it. Yeah, that's that was such a bad game. Um, and for it to be again a game that is so adaptable, and for them not to even get the basics of interface right is just yeah. The reviews here, the UI is awful. Oh, it, it's unplayable. Um. And they had so much shine and so much money. I don't know what the fuck they were doing. Yeah. So, wow, wow, wow. Yeah. All right. Well, that, that okay. would be it. That's awesome. Well, uh, thanks, everyone, for tuning in to episode 431 of Prof and Dev Play Games. Thanks to Bill for being here. Let's Aww. make it less than two years before you come back again. Well, that would be lovely. I, we, we could avoid, actually, it was it two years or three? I thought it was three. I thought it was longer than two. I thought, yeah, it, is, uh, it was one year from my first appearance to two. And then, yeah, it, it was, I, I think it was just at the beginning of the pandemic we were talking about. So it's been a while. It's but anyway, while. thank Glad you for having you back, me though. back. I love this podcast. People go and do the like and subscribe. You know, there's a criminally low number of likes and subscribes on YouTube, I notice. 
That's for and sure. It doesn't cost you anything but a couple clicks. Smash that bell. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks. Well, thanks for listening. Next week, it'll be me and my daughter, which will be awesome. Ooh. And then the week after that, Anthony will be back from Japan, although he may be tired as fuck. So we'll see how he's doing. Um, but thanks, everyone, for listening. And we will see you next week. Thank you. Bye.